Hey there, I'm Punky Tolson, and this is the Life on Life podcast, where life and faith come together as we walk it out together. Well, hey, everybody, and come on in for another episode of Life on Life. I'm really excited about my guest today. Um, He is one of my favorite people on the planet today. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I wonder where oh, today. Well, it changes with the day. Is that what you're implying? Shh, I haven't They're reading yet. between the lines here, so, so you need in to be the very first, concise and precise. In the first couple of this is my <laughs> podcast. In the first couple of episodes, I uh, introduced you to my husband John um, through telling you a little bit about my story and then how we met. And today, I want to introduce you to him in person. He's here with me on the podcast today. So this meet could my be, man, This could be trouble John, right here. <laughs> John Tolson. Um, yes. We have been okay. married for 18 years. Yeah, that's a little right. over 18 years. And they know our story and yeah. how we got together and um, <laughs> how uh, you almost blew it. I didn't really share that part with them. But. No, you didn't. You were very kind. Yeah. So, but, but you're here today. if something happens and you have a bad day, it could all come out. That's right. Yeah, there you go. But John is uh, not only my husband and someone that I just have so much esteem and respect for as a follower of Jesus. He's a wonderful and gifted teacher, but the thing that God has absolutely burdened his heart with for um, many decades now is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. And I do not, I really don't know another person on this planet personally who has the kind of passion and get up and go that you do about what God's called you to do in this life. And you have been unwavering and you have been um, so steadfast and so passionate. You've sustained such a passion for it for all the years I've known you. And then there was a good 25-ish years before that that you were getting after it, putting your boots on, saddling up, and riding it out every day. So I'm grateful. For you and grateful to have you thank you join me today it's so, great to be here so let's just um go back to the first episode or second episode of the life on life podcast when i did share my story and i started out with a question that you asked me on our first date do you remember what it was of course i do what was it the question was if you could do anything you wanted to do no you couldn't fail money mm-hmm. weren't a problem what would you want to do mm-hmm and then you remember you, I was hesitating and thinking about that, and you asked me another question. What was I most passionate yeah, about? Yeah, what are you most passionate about? Because I think the first question elicits the second question. What are you most passionate about? It's a summary way to say it. Uh-huh. So explain that a little bit more, like what about passion and where that comes from. Yeah, well, for me personally, I think, uh, without getting into a lot of detail, it has to go back to when I came to know Christ going into the 10th grade year in high mm-hmm. school. That's when the seed was planted. Yeah. But as time went on and as I watched people that I admired and how they operated and how God used them, um, I think that was a further cultivation of uh, what God was uh, working on in me. But anyway, one day uh, back in Dallas years ago, I was looking for something in a folder and out of the folder fell a card. And I picked it up and said, huh, that's interesting. Um, And I literally remembered who was speaking when I took this note uh, a couple years before that time. And this is what was on the card. If you could do anything you want to do, no, you couldn't fail a money were a problem, what would you do? So I uh, got a notebook over the next couple months. uh, I wrote down in that notebook anything that came to my mind that uh, was elicited by that question. So uh, eventually, I took all of that I had written down and I summarized it in one paper, Mm. on one page. And uh, really what was coming out of me uh, was a dream that I believe God had planted in there uh, and a desire to do that dream uh, and it culminated on that one piece of paper. So uh, basically what happened very uh, briefly is about two months later, I get a phone call from a friend in Chattanooga. He said, there's a preacher in Houston uh, of a big church, uh, downtown church, and they're looking for somebody to work with students. 
And I told this pastor, my friend said, that before he selects somebody to do that work, that he needs to talk to you about your philosophy of youth work. And so about a few weeks later, this pastor calls, said, can I come visit you? He flies in on a Sunday afternoon to Dallas, comes to my home. For two or three hours, we talked about the philosophy. And then he said, well, John, what's your dream? I said, well, thank you for asking. I said, most people don't care enough to ask. Mm -hmm. So I leaned down and I had my briefcase there. I pulled out my piece of paper and gave it to him. He read it, <clears throat> excuse me, he read it. And he said, uh, I've never read anything like that before. I said, it's mine. And So uh, what was that dream? What did you well, have on that paper? Uh, <clears throat> basically what was on that paper was uh, I wanted to live in a, large, in a big city uh, I wanted to work with leaders in that city, reach them for Christ, cultivate them in their faith, build a faith foundation, and help them to uh, impact their families, their community, uh, as a result of their growing and maturing faith in Jesus Christ. And I wanted to be able to be freed up to focus on that and not a lot of other things that a lot of times you have to do if you're working in a church mm -hmm. where you have a lot of responsibility in the job description. I wanted to be freed up to be able to focus on that. So it, as, in essence, that was the dream. Mm -hmm. but, and your heart was really burdened for uh, working with men. Primarily, primarily. men, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think I'd come to that uh, conclusion um, through several things. One living in Dallas and working in the area that I lived in in Dallas, a very wealthy area, I had several observations that I made. Number one was uh, when a kid came to know Christ through our work, went back to their family uh, for encouragement in their newfound faith. Uh, typically, if they got any encouragement at all, it was from mama, not daddy. Uh, number two, most pastors that I knew, I did not think, I, at that time anyway, that they took uh, time, intentional time, to build men individually that they spent time with. They might have somebody on their church staff that worked with men or the men's ministry, but they themselves weren't investing in men one-on-one. Mm -hmm. -on -one. Uh, third thing was on a typical Sunday morning in churches where I'd speak in Dallas or outside of Dallas, uh, they were there were a lot more women in the pews than there were men. So my question was, where are the men? Mm -hmm. And then also, finally, during that time, a study had been done, a national study that basically said in a family, if the man was not plugged into Christ, if the father was not plugged into Christ, that there was about a 22 to 23 percent chance that the kids someday might come to Christ. But if the daddy was plugged into the Lord, then there was almost a 90 percent chance that those children would come to know someday the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so I said, when I put all that together, I said, we've got to do something in our country uh, with men. At that time, there was no promise keepers, which became a big movement a few years later. There wasn't really much going on, at least on the national scene, to impact men for Christ. Yep. So that's yeah. kind of what was... Uh, uh, laid on my yeah, heart. And, and, it, and I mean, really, I think the Lord has just seared that into your heart, in, into your life, and it's become ministry. And out of that, the gathering of men came about. But Correct. I remember when we were dating, and I would see you, you know, with groups of people, like we go to a party or something, or even after church, and I would just see men huddled around you, like really in a true huddle with you. And I thought, this guy has like the spiritual gift of men. I know that's not you know, a legit spiritual gift in the scripture, but we are supposed to um, just love one another well. And you've done that with men so very well to the point that um, I actually see men coming to love God through the way that you fire them up and encourage them and challenge them and spur them on in their faith, which is, has been so wonderful to see even in these um, almost 16 years we've lived mm -hmm. in Dallas to see how the ministry of the gathering of men has, has grown and how many different age groups of, of men are represented there and just to see kind of this life reproducing mm -hmm. there which again is that's your big um, that's your big thing your, th that's the ministry of your heart is to go and make disciples well that's what I did for years with students with <laughs> high school kids and, mm -hmm. and uh, junior high now they call it middle school kids um, and I just transferred that over to with men. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of my uh, guys that impacted me a lot, a guy named Jim Smith, um, 
he said, basically, adults are just big kids. <laughs> and so what I've seen is, that's basically true for all of us. We're just big kids. And by that, I mean, they're, they're still growing, they're still developing, they're still sometimes infantile. Uh, in terms of their behavior. But not you. Not me. Oh, no, no, I'm the leader. I'm the leader, yeah. yeah. i got to have my stuff all together, which yeah. I don't. Yeah. But we're working on it. Well, um, okay, so back to that question. Um, um, that's really giving, it gave you permission to dream. When you asked me that, it gave me permission to dream. I kind of, you know, answered that question, ended up being a life yeah purpose statement um, for me and ministry also. But so what would you say to any of the women listening out there about um, their passion and their dreams? Because that subject of dreams is such such a hot subject right now. Yeah. We've got everybody telling everybody to go follow your dreams and chase your dreams and yeah. go for your dreams. And so <clears throat> biblically speaking, and just but just as a as a, a man who has done this and how would you encourage and you're such an encourager of women, you're such an encourager to me. But how would you encourage the women out there? Well, first of all, I'd say, let me tell you what holds most women back and men back from going for their dream. Uh, number one is there is a deficiency often in a person's development of their relationship with Jesus. They may be people that know Christ, mm. but they're people that aren't developing and growing in their relationship with Christ through the scripture and through the basic disciplines uh, that we need to all be growing in as we develop that relationship with him. You know, and it's very interesting too, I'll just pause here and say that I really believe in our country right now that the problem is not with non-believers, the problem is with believers. The believers that are not developing, the believers that are not growing, and in this instance what we're talking about now, uh, men and women who hold back as a result of not developing and growing and maturing and don't go for the dreams that God has planted in their hearts. Mm -hmm. And those dreams, if they're dreams in a believer's life, they're always going to going to move towards impacting the lives of other people mm -hmm. because of their faith. So that's the first thing. The second thing, I believe as a result of that, men and women have a low self-esteem or understanding of their significance yeah. and as a result of that they don't take a risk they don't step out I can't do it mm -hmm. in fact I often I will be in groups of people where I lay that question out if you could do anything you wanted to do what would you do and even just to pretend a lot of times I see men that won't even pretend and write on a piece of paper well if I if I could do this is what I would do if I could do it they won't even go through the exercise. Mm. They're mm. so afraid and fearful of stepping out. But I still think it goes back to, number one, that relationship with Christ and the health of it. And number two, as a result of that, they really don't understand the person, the special person they are in the eyes of God. Mm -hmm. I so agree with that. How did that sense of your, your worth and significance in Christ come about for you because your background, your growing up mm -hmm. years were not the greatest mm -hmm. um, and you had a lot of stuff to overcome. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. where did that sense of your true value, worth, identity, and significance in Christ come from? How did that come about for you? Well, I, it, it has to go back to uh, my growing relationship with Christ, which started, as I mentioned earlier, <laughs> before I, I went into the 10th grade year in high school. Uh, but I think I put so much of my uh, worth and value coming along, even after I came to know Christ, on my ability to play sports well. Hmm. I remember one night, my senior year, uh, we p were playing, I can, I can remember the team, the, everything, right now, years later, we were playing at home against Robinson High School from Tampa, Florida. We won the game that night. Everybody did great. Everybody scored. And I think I had like seven points, and I was used to scoring 20 to 21 points. And I literally went home that night, went to my room, got in the bed, turned the light out, and for the next hour cried. Mm. Because everything at that point in my life was based upon putting a ball in a hole, yeah. playing basketball and doing great in it. So... Um, as time went on, and after college, and after graduate school, and after getting married, uh, and through uh, 
continual growth in my faith and having some great models around me of secure men, Mm -hmm. what I started learning was what God thought about me. Mm -hmm. And the the five things that I always say now that changed me was, number one, God made me. Number two, God loves me. Whether I score zero points, negative points, or a bunch of points, he loves me no matter what, and he'll never change about that. Number three, that Christ died for me. Number four, he's got a plan for my life. And number five, he's gifted me. And there's so much more. Mm-hmm. But those five things have more and more over the years been embedded in me, mm-hmm. not just in my head, but they've been ingrained in me and have helped determine how I look at me. Yeah. And, and are those things that you, just personally, do you, do you write those things down every day? Do you say those things to yourself? There's so much of a rewriting our hard drive mm-hmm. and our brain is overriding it with God's truth, which is what you just yeah. said and what Paul sure. talks about in Second Corinthians. But just how mm-hmm. do you practically do well, that? Well, let me ask you a question. Mm-hmm. What does Romans 12, 2 say about the mind? And we are transformed by the renewing by the of renewal. our minds. So you got to uh-huh. think right. Right. So Mm -hmm. what has happened over the years, my thinking has been changed as a result of being exposed to what God says Mm -hmm. and not what the culture or the world around me says. Yes. And that is where the change is is continually going on. Yeah. Yeah. It's got to start. Yeah. Yeah. It's the change your mind. If I don't think right, I ain't going to act right. 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 So change your mind, change your heart, change your life. Yeah, exactly. But I think, you know, there's such merit, too, in in writing those things down. Oh, no. And, and to repeating them. Yeah. I, I say so often, our own ears have to hear mm-hmm. our own ve- voice yeah. proclaiming, declaring, confessing God's truth. No doubt about it. If you us. come in our office right now, I've got a little card with those five things mm-hmm. on it, and I look at it, I read it, I give it to people, and uh, sure, I, it's a. I mean, I just what I just said to you came out of my heart and my head because I know it, mm-hmm. and it's it's embedded in there. Yeah. Those are five really uh, foundational, pivotal things that um, we're going to unpack a little bit in season two of the Life on Life podcast. So you're going to have me back? Maybe. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I won't. I'm just kidding. Do a spoiler alert now what we're going to do, but that's going to be part of what we're going to talk about. But um, no, thank you for sharing that. There's so much more, and I will have you come back. because there's so much more. Well, I would just say this to the ladies out there, that if you ever really get the picture, God's picture of you, and by the way, one of my friends said, when we go to heaven, if God has a wallet, he's going to have your picture in it. (laughs) That's what he thinks. That's how highly he thinks of you. And so if we really ever understood what he thinks of us, then we could be set free to be all he wants us to be and to do all he wants us to do. And so uh, I don't think any of us want to get to the point one day where we look back and it's all over and we're ready to go to him and we're going to look back and say, gosh, I wish I'd have done this. I wish I would have done mm-hmm. that if I would have only, you know, uh, not held back. Mm-hmm. So now's the time not to hold back. Yeah. And I think, too, the hard part with all of that is um, – acting as if Mm -hmm. Uh, you know when you can't feel it Mm -hmm. you act based on what you know that it's a fact of what God says about you Mm -hmm. and we have to just take it by faith and walk it out by faith before it becomes no doubt about it and And that's what's hard especially excuse me when you've got a background of people speaking things over you that aren't true that's right but here's the here's the 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 opposite of that is you've got to build a team to your dream You've got to have solid people around you that love the Lord, Mm -hmm. that love you, and want the best for you. Mm -hmm. They are your cheerleaders. They're going to give you insight. They're going to give you so many things that you need to be able to do what God has laid on your heart. Mm -hmm. You've got to have some of those people around you. Absolutely. Am I on your team? You are on my team number one. Don't I tell you that all the time? Especially when I have to talk about something hard when we've kind of been scratchy and I have to say I have to preface it with don't forget I'm I'm on your team team. I'm on your team and then I unload (laughs) (laughs) so so do you want to tell um, my friends out there that are listening how wonderful it is to be married to me you know what (laughs) if it got any better I couldn't stand it (laughs) 
<laughs> that's just, it's embarrassing how good it is. When God lines you up with, so a, with a person that loves him as, as a result of punky loving the Lord so much, I get the benefits of that. Mm -hmm. She loves me a whole bunch. Mm -hmm. And it, it, uh, I really mean that from the bottom of my heart. Well, I love you back. And yeah. we have an incredible story, which I told everybody about um, yeah. from my perspective um, in, season, in a, season one of the podcast on the second episode but um yeah it's a it's an incredible story well what i'd and, say too I, you i mean yep. we could go on forever here a lot of this probably cut we out but uh <laughs> if will. any of you listening to this if you ever want to put a bunch of folks together in a home one night couples and have punk and i come tell our story we'd love to do that and maybe couples that might really be encouraged by that the john and punky comedy hour <laughs> well, it, 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 it's, we it's, do laugh a lot though we laugh a lot oh life's too serious to, too hurting. We got to laugh. <laughs> I know. No, Mary, what is the, uh, the little thing that I've seen embroidered in pillows? Marry a man who loves to laugh and makes you laugh and loves to dance. Well, I got. <laughs> well, Punky said, I'm the best dancer she's ever seen in her life from the neck up. I can move that neck, but the rest of it doesn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we'll, we'll stop at this point, leave everybody in suspense, sure. and we'll get together another. Okay. On another episode, but thank you for stopping by. Thank you for letting thank you for me leaving your office and walking down here to, to talk to us. I thank love you. you. I love you. You're great. Thanks. <laughs> okay, guys. Well, that's that for that. I hope you enjoyed that little session with my man. He's a great guy, and I will have him back on the podcast from time to time. Um, he's one of the wisest men I know, one of the funniest men I know, and one of the biggest lovers of Jesus that I know. So I'm glad you got to spend some time with him today. All right. Well, we'll get back to you next week. And don't you forget that you're greatly and dearly loved by the King. Hi guys, Michelle here. Okay, so we just have a few more episodes left in season one, and we'd love to know how this podcast has encouraged you and who you've been walking it out with. We want to meet you, your Life on Life friends, and get to know all about you guys. Show us how you listen and where you listen by using the hashtag LifeOnLifePodcast. Speaking of others finding us, please remember to subscribe where you listen and give us a review and share this podcast with your friends. And remember, you can always find all the helpful info mentioned today in the show notes, or you can read the full episode online at punkytolson.com blog. That's all for now. See you next week for another episode of the Life on Life podcast.